Karshi went right to ECNDT today, the situation has changed. So we have um, a full day session about modeling. And um, I think this is an impressive um, um, point that um, things have changed dramatically. So we have a lot of very interesting, very powerful simulation tools available. <coughs> and today in the morning, I would like to present to you um, a modeling platform Morning. that we have um, built up in the frame of a German national research project um, at the modeling platform for ultrasonic immersion testing of uh, polycrystalline materials. And <coughs> I will, um, that's an ongoing project, and I will show you the features of this modeling tool um, at this time. It's not finished yet, but uh, I think it uh, still has some. Um, um, remarkable um, uh, features. My name is Frank Schubert. I'm from the Fraunhofer Institute for Ceramic Technologies and Systems from the branch <coughs> Materials Diagnostics. That is the former ISFP in Dresden. And um, let's start with the motivation of this work. So the immersion <coughs> testing is still um, one of the most important measurement uh, setups in non-destructive testing. Um, we'll find it in a lot of applications. And in order to optimize the relevant UT configurations for specific materials and flaws, a detailed understanding of the interaction between ultrasonic waves and specimen is essential. This includes, for example, the excited wave field in water the reflection and the transmission of the water-solid interface, mode conversion effects between pressure and shear waves, and vice versa, the shortening of the focal lengths in the solid medium, the interaction with the specific microstructure of the material, the interaction with the defect, reflections at the back wall, including multiple reflections between the top and bottom surface, and of course, the propagation path back <coughs> to the transducer. So most of um, the mentioned aspects are in general guided by wave physics. This is of particular importance if the dominant wavelength of the ultrasonic excitation um, is comparable to the lateral size of the floor and or the grain size of the microstructure. So in this work, I will present a numerical wave physical modeling platform for ultrasonic immersion testing that is based on the so-called elastodynamic finite integration technique. That's a full numerical um, UT solver. And the special focus um, in this work will be on complex microstructures, as you can see here, from um, optical micrograph. And <coughs> what we have, or what we had in mind in this project was to investigate this typical grain noise appearing if you perform ultrasonic testing um, for such kind of material. So the numerical solvers that we developed for this platform are available in 2D, 3D, and for some specific cases also for 3D axisymmetric problems. And as I mentioned before, this work is part of an ongoing project um, about calculation of ultrasound scattering or a better detection of crack line flaws in austenitic weldments that is funded by the BMVE in Germany. So let's start with the um, numerical technique that we are using. I think most of you are familiar with this technique or at least have heard about this technique. <coughs> it's called elastodynamic finite integration technique. And um, the specific point here is that this technique um, does not directly discretize the wave equation. Instead, it is discretizing um, the integral form of the governing equations given by the Cauchy equation of motion and the equation of deformation rate. So discretization means that you separate your computational domain into um, finite 
um, grid cells, either in Cartesian or cylindrical or spherical coordinates, for example. And if it is using a technique, um, a so-called staggered grid, that means the different field components of the code, in this case, the <coughs> uh, particle velocity components and the stress components are located on different positions inside um, the material cell or the integration cell, as shown here for the different um, coordinate systems. So this leads to a very powerful and stable numerical code, and uh, this code has been validated in the past uh, for a lot of different uh, applications, so we compared it successfully to mm. analytical solutions, but also to experimental solutions. The most important ones are given here on this slide. So we um, mm. did some comparisons with analytical solutions, um, considering um, the plate response due to a mechanical impact. We investigated um, scattering by voids and spherical inclusions by plate waves. We investigated the transient behavior of laser ultrasonics, compared it with um, analytical solutions and also with um, experiments done by laser vibrometry. And on the right you can see another example where we did some experimental comparisons um, with the simulation results um, obtained in um, a rail with vertical cracks. So in all these cases, um, the EFIT solver shows that it is capable to deal with these problems and that it's able to reproduce um, the exact or the, the correct result. So this tool has been used also in this project and um, I will <coughs> show you some different models um, in this presentation and let's start with the very simplest model it's uh, first of all a homogeneous model in order to give you a uh, feeling about the um, phenomena that are occurring here. So we have um, the water uh, pass in front of the transducer and we have the solid material. In this case it's a titanium but could be any other kind of solid. Um, we can work with unfocused or focused transducers. The first simulation I will show you uh, is using an unfocused transducer. So we are exciting the transducer by a transient roadband pulse. This pulse um, generates pressure waves in the water and um, now on the right you can see some um, time domain wavefront snapshots giving the absolute value of the particle velocity vector. Um, but you can see how the wave propagates in space and time. You can see the um, edge waves, the waves coming from <coughs> the edges or the edge of the transducer. And um, then it hits the interface, water, titanium. And then, of course, we have a transmitted wave, a transmitted P wave. In the titanium, we have a reflected wave um, running back to the transducer. We also have some secondary uh, shear wave contributions in the solid um, generated by mode conversion. You can also see that um, due to the <coughs> sorry <coughs> due to the um, higher wave speed and that means uh, the larger wavelengths in the uh, titanium, uh, you can see the difference here in, in wavelengths compared to the water. And of course, the wave speed is um, larger. That means the wave travels faster to the back wall. Then we have the reflection at the back wall. The wave is propagating back to the transducer. Also, this reflected wave is propagating back to the transducer. And then um, the back wall echo once again hits the interface, resulting again in a reflected wave and a transmitted wave. What you can see here, this is the back wall echo moving back to the transducer where it can be detected. I forgot to mention that <coughs> uh, in order to, to give a better um, representation, I increased the amplitude of the particle velocity vector in these um, time domain snapshots in titanium by a factor of four. 
otherwise you would not see uh, very much details. And then <coughs> at the position of the transducer we are able to calculate um, the reflected time domain signal and um, what you can see is the excitation pulse here. Then we have the um, interface echo uh, followed by the first backward echo and then due to the multiple reflection between top and uh, uh, bottom surface of the titanium plate you also get second, third, fourth um, interface uh, or backward echo, sorry, um, with some um, decreasing amplitude. There are also some slight contributions from shear waves, but they don't play an important role here. Okay, then let's uh, have a look at the same model, but now using a focus transducer, in this case with a focus of 76 millimeter in water, that means the surface of the solid is in the near field uh, of the uh, transducer. You can see the difference um, if the wave hits the interface. You can see how the outer parts of the wave behave different compared to the first um, simulation. And we have a focusing to a specific depth in the solid material. And what you can also see is <coughs> that due to the focusing, um, you get um, a stronger shear wave mode conversion but this is also a secondary effect, so it does not play any significant role here, but in the experiment you're also able to see this contribution. This is due to the focusing of the transducer. And then again we have the reflection at the back wall and the propagation back to the transducer. Um, this is an overall picture showing the intensity uh, in these two parts of the model. So first of all, this is a typical, in, in water we have the typical um, intensity plot for um, uh, a transducer, a focus transducer. As I mentioned, the focus is uh, very long compared to the distance between transducer and uh, interface. And inside the titanium, then we have the typical effect of the shortening of the focal length. That means uh, due to the mismatch in, uh, in wave speeds, um, we have a focus here in the solid material, which is in the range of, uh, uh, let's say, six or seven millimeters uh, below the interface. So the corresponding um, time domain um, A scan is uh, given here. So we have, again, the interface echo, back wall echo one and two, and you can see that the shear wave contribution has increased a bit. <coughs> now in the third step, let's um, introduce um, a defect. <coughs> Could be, in principle, any kind of defect. In this case, I uh, have chosen um, a so-called flat bottom hole with a diameter of uh, three millimeters in this case. Three millimeters in this case is comparable to the wavelengths of the P wave in, in the solid. And um, I once again used uh, a focus transducer with a focus of 76 millimeter in water. And we can follow the wave propagation process again. You can see the focusing, uh, so if the wave hits the flat bottom hole very precisely. So the energy is focused to a specific region. Uh, at a specific depth. And then we have the reflection at the flat bottom hole. You can see there are a lot of other secondary effects going on. We have a mode converted shear, wave, shear waves coming from the, the edge of the flat bottom hole. We have some so-called head wave um, uh, generations if the P wave um, travels along the, the free interface. And um, this Scattered wave, of course, is also reflected and transmitted at the interface between the water and the titanium. And then you can see the wave field is quite complex in the solid material. And um, <coughs> if we look here in the region behind this um, first echo from the flat bottom hole, you can see a couple of other contributions. And if we look to the Corresponding A scan, we can see now we have a very small back wall echo due to shadowing effects, and we have a strong flat bottom wall echo due to the focus wave field. We also can see um, the second back wall echo. We also have <coughs> some uh, secondary contributions coming from multiple reflections between the interface and the flat bottom hole, and also coming from mode conversion effects. So, with this simulation you were able to 
precisely identify all these um, different wave modes. Now if we have a look back to the simulation, you can see that the, the scattered wave field is um, yeah, more or less focused into the back wall, the backward direction. If you <coughs> decrease the diameter of the flat bottom hole, as is shown here in model number four, uh, you will see that the backscattering characteristic is also changing. So in this case, the backwater backscattered wave has a, a broader angle of, of backscattering. This is, of course, um, caused by the smaller uh, diameter of the flat bottom hole. And you can study all these different effects, um, how they uh, influence the final a scan that uh, can be calculated at the position of the transducer. You can see here in this case there is still um, a significant um, flat bottom hole echo visible, but it uh, is decreased compared <coughs> to the larger uh, flat bottom hole diameter, of course. So this makes sense, this is plausible, and the model is um, consistent with uh, experimental findings. Now let's come to the interesting part um, of such a model that is the introduction of um, uh, heterogeneous base material and in this uh, project we are uh, dealing with uh, polycrystalline materials and um, in the model we um, included or we um, generated such a model by using so-called uh, Voronoi tessellations. In this case you can see an isometric Voronoi tessellation. Um, we are also able to um, work with uh, weighted Voronoi tessellations or textured Voronoi tessellations. You can also use so-called Laguerre tessellations if you're familiar with this. And um, we can embed our defect in this heterogeneous material. You can see each grain here um, is indicated by a different grayscale. That means that the elasticity parameters change from grain to grain. Um, in this platform, we are able to deal with both isotropic grains and anisotropic grains, and um, we can arbitrarily change the parameters of the grains. Here on the right, you can see a so-called VAR parameter that gives you the fluctuation of the elasticity uh, around the mean value. In this case, it means that um, the elasticity of the grains are fluctuating between plus and minus 10% around the mean value, and of course this parameter is important for the scattering behavior of the microstructure. And now let's see how this microstructure interacts with um, the pressure wave. You can see again the focusing of the wave field, but you can see here additionally uh, grain noise appearing that is due to the um, interaction uh, between the ultrasonic waves and the microstructure. There is there's some multiple scattering going on. And of course, this energy is taken away from the primary wave. That means the primary wave is um, attenuated compared to the situation uh, without um, polycrystalline background medium. So once again, we have a significant echo coming from the flat bottom hole. In this case, I used again the uh, three millimeter FBH. And you can see all this grain noise um, appearing in the solid medium. And this grain noise is also transferred to the water and is moving back <coughs> to the transducer where it can be detected. It's not so clearly visible here in the wavefront snapshots, but it is better visible here in the corresponding A scan. So again, we have um, the uh, echo indications um, from the flat bottom hole and from the back wall, but now superimposed, we can see some first um, contributions coming from um, the grains, so-called grain noise. Now, in the model, of course, we are able to increase parameters like the VAR parameter. In this case, I increased it by a factor of two. That means now the fluctuations in the elasticity parameters between the grains um, is um, the fluctuation is plus or minus 20% uh, around the mean value. 
and um, <clears throat> the mean grain size of 1.5 millimeter is um, the same <coughs> as in the previous um, simulation. And now, if we look to the interaction of the wave field, we can see that the interaction is significantly larger. So there is a strong backscattering, uh, strong multiple reflections uh, occurring. And you can see that the attenuation of the primary wave is um, uh, also stronger, of course. And you can see here only a very weak <coughs> contribution moving back to the interface and uh, finally to the detecting transducers. You can see that the energy is spreading in this heterogeneous medium, so it's some kind of uh, diffusive uh, energy transport taking place here. And um, if you look to the A scan, you can see that the FBH echo is uh, further decreased and the grain noise is um, increased so that you are no longer able to identify the backward echo, for example. Of course, um, we are able to um, change the characteristic of the microstructure, so from very large grains to very small grains, and we did a lot of uh, simulations where we studied the impact of the mean grain size uh, on wave field by um, keeping all the other parameters um, constant. <coughs> you can see in this case that um, the interaction with the microstructure is still significant, but it's uh, a bit um, weaker than in the previous case. And um, you can see again the echo from the flat bottom hole. And if we look to the final A scan, you can see that um, the flat bottom hole echo is a bit higher compared to the previous case. And um, the grain noise is also decreased by a small factor. Um, what we have found out, and that is once again in a good uh, agreement with experimental findings, is that the attenuation um, is first of all frequency dependent, of course. And it's becoming larger if the grain size is enlarged. So this uh, qualitative finding is uh, identical to what we see in the experiments. And that once again shows that uh, the model is uh, able to, to um, reproduce at least the qualitative behavior of ultrasonic scattering in, in such a microstructure. Um, in the project, we were also interested in um, finding out if it's possible to find uh, measurement setups that um, improve the signal-to-noise ratio. And of course, in such a medium, you can think about averaging techniques. And um, in the model, we are able, for example, to um, laterally or vertically move the transducers by a fraction of the wavelengths in order to see how this influences the, um, the multiply scattered wave field. And um, some typical examples um, are showing here, giving by different colors. Um, what you can see here <coughs> is um, that we have some significant but weak amplitude deviations, but there is unfortunately no phase shift uh, available that would be the basis for an efficient averaging technique. So uh, at least in this case, um, averaging is not very efficient. Uh, this medium. Um, this lateral movement of the transducer can also be done in the vertical direction, and um, I have not enough time to show it here in the presentation, but you can also do it if you like. And of course, we are also able to um, investigate tilted transducers. In this case, I will give um, an example where the transducer is. Um, working with an inclination angle of uh, three degrees, which is quite large, but it's uh, only to show you um, the, the change or the difference compared to the inclination angle of uh, zero degrees. You can see <coughs> that the right part of the wave field hits the surface um, earlier than the left part, and the um, wave is, um, well, 
generate it in a direction so that it can no longer hit um, the flat bottom hole in this case any longer. That's the reason why in this case um, the echo from the back from the flat bottom hole is no longer visible, or at least in this uh, wavefront animation it's not visible. Um, in the A scan we have maybe a slight indication, but you can see it's effectively not, not there. And um, so the question is, why do we need uh, tilted transducers? So it um, brings me to another interesting um, effect coming into play if we are looking for textured or road microstructures. We know from the experiment that uh, this kind of microstructure produces a very strong backscattering, very disturbing backscattering, making ultrasonic immersion testing uh, impossible in some cases. And um, let's have a look um, to this um, model. You can see, again, some focusing of the primary wave. And then we have a very strong backscattering um, taking place in this microstructure. This is obtained for an inclination angle of uh, zero. We have strong backscattering. You can see it here um, following the primary wave. And in the A scan, <coughs> you can see a very well typical um, wave field that can also nearly in the same uh, manner can be seen in experimental data. There might be the echo from the flat bottom hole, but you cannot be sure if you don't know that uh, the echo is there. Um, so the question is, um, is it possible to get rid of um, this backscattering? And um, the idea in this project was to find out if, if we tilt the transducer a bit, how does it influence the scattering, backscattering behavior of the microstructure and of the flat bottom hole? Because the idea was that um, the backscattering characteristic is different between flat bottom hole and the microstructure, and maybe by tilting the transducers, we we are able to, to separate between these different um, contributions. So we did it for an inclination angle of one degree. And if you compare it here with the zero degrees um, result, you can see there is a slight effect. So some reduction of the backscattering is there. <coughs> but unfortunately, also the flat bottom echo is uh, decreased finally the same factor. So that means we don't have really an improvement of the signal to noise ratio. So you see that even by, by this kind of, of setup, it's um, difficult to, to get some improvements here. If we increase the inclination angle to three degrees, you can see backscattering is further decreased, but the flat bottom hole echo is also decreased. And so you cannot uh, see it any longer here. So this makes some um, uh, measurements um, in such microstructures uh, so difficult. Um, beside these uh, conventional transducers, we are also able to deal with uh, specific um, transducer geometries, so for example, phased arrays, or for example, axicon lenses, as is shown here. So we also tried to find out if axicon lenses are um, able to improve the signal-to-noise ratio um, axicons are typically used in cases where you want to have a very long focal area in different uh, depths of the, of the solid material. And you can see it um, here uh, already in the time domain snapshot. Um, backscattering is still very significant, so there is no improvement. And um, you can see that if you compare the cases with axicon and with the conventional focus transducer having the same, the same aperture, then you can see not really a difference. So flat bottom hole echo might be there, <coughs> but cannot be identified very clearly. And at least in this case, uh, we also had no significant improvement of the signal to noise ratio in this case. So let's uh, come to my last um, slide. I want to summarize the current features in this modeling platform. So uh, we are following a so-called three model philosophy. That means that um, by um, uh, changing a single parameter, we are able to uh, shift from 2D to 3D models and vice versa. And in some cases, also 3D axisymmetric uh, solvers are available. 
Uh, so we can all do this in two and three dimensions. Of course, in three dimensions, the computational effort is uh, quite large, but it's possible uh, on conventional PCs with uh, quite uh, large uh, ROM memory. We can deal with focused and unfocused transducers, also with tilted transducers. Um, that's of course only makes sense in, in 2D and 3D, not in the axisymmetric case. It can also work with uh, arbitrary aperture segmentation. So it means, for example, phased arrays. I didn't show it here, but it's uh, possible to define independent elements that you can um, excite and detect separately. We are able to deal with uh, specific lens designs, for example, axicons. Um, we can define time delays for single elements. We can do full matrix capture if this is needed. It was not shown here in this presentation, but it's possible in principle. Um, I have shown examples in immersion testing. You can do the same in contact technique. Um, all the relevant wave <coughs> types are available. Pressure waves, shear waves, surface waves. Uh, if you carefully look to the uh, wavefront snapshots, you will also find so-called leaky waves and interface waves. They are also there automatically because um, that's a full numerical code um, discretizing more or less uh, the wave equation in a certain <coughs> form. Um, we can deal with various kinds of defects. Uh, I showed flat bottom holes only, but we can introduce uh, drillings, notches, voids, elastic inclusions, etc. Um, then we are able to deal with uh, polycrystalline microstructures, for example, random isometric uh, textured and weighted Voronoi tessellations. Um, the grains could be isotropic or anisotropic. Of course, in case of anisotropy, you need the corresponding um, elastic parameters of the grains, which is in some cases <coughs> not so easy to obtain. We can work with arbitrary distributions of the grain size and the grain orientation. And finally, at the moment, we have a good qualitative agreement between simulation and experiment. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this platform is part of an ongoing um, project. And we are now in the second stage of this project, where we will um, do a quantitative comparison between 3D models and um, experimental results. And I hope that I can show you um, examples or results of this comparison um, in the near future. So that's all for now. Thank you very much for listening. At the end, I can um, maybe point to the fact that uh, we are not restricted to this kind of polycrystalline microstructures. We can also deal, for example, with particulate microstructures, which are also interesting for some kinds of application. So if you think that um, this model could be interesting for your own work, then don't hesitate to ask me and we can discuss uh, further details. Thank you very much and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes, please. I have two questions. One uh, very short one. Uh, how much time do you need for uh, simulating the A-scan? Um, in two dimensions, it's a um, maximum a few minutes. In three dimensions, could be a few hours. Okay, thank you. Or and days, if you. Pardon? Or days, if uh, or days. the frequency is very high, for example, 15, 20 yeah. megahertz, it could be days. Okay. And uh, much more uh, yeah, physical <coughs> because uh, I don't understand exactly your brain model. Um, Normally, a polycrystalline material, uh, each grain is a single crystal, and uh, the um, difference in elastic constants is only caused by the different orientation. But you have only one parameter, and uh, vary this parameter somehow, accidentally, or whatever, with the, uh, yeah, the overall isotropic uh, elastic constants. Yes. So there's, how do you only, there's only one possibility. I mentioned uh -huh. it. Uh, I think uh, we, are, we are able to do both. We can use each grain as a locally isotropic uh, meter, for example. 
but we are also able to um, define each grain, uh, as you mentioned, as a single crystal with a certain orientation. And then we can define the <coughs> corresponding um, uh, elasticity, par elasticity parameters to this certain grain. This is also possible. Both is possible, but as I mentioned, uh, in some cases it's not easy to, to get these um, parameters in our project. We try to do it uh, by, to, to some extent, but you can do both in 2 and 3D. Is there a difference in evaluation time if you need only this parameter? Not really. It's uh, in the, well, less than 1% or so. It's only a question of how to define the material grid. And of course, it depends a, a bit on the wave speed because the, um, the size of the grid uh, depends on the elasticity parameters. But um, I would say it's, it's, not, it's not much. It's maximum a few percent. Okay. More questions? Yes? Uh, two mm -hmm. questions also uh, from my side. You're doing a time domain modeling. You could easily do a frequency domain modeling also. What is the advantage of doing the time domain in this case? Well, in principle, you are right. Um, if you use a, a transient uh, wave with a certain frequency band, you could also do it in principle in the frequency domain. But, um, well, I think from my point of view, the, the um, the origin of EFIT comes from the time domain simulations. That's one reason, of course. The other reason is I think it's more intu intuitive because um, what we have, what we can show here, is exactly the same what is um, uh, appearing in the in the experiment. In the experiment, normally, not in all cases, but in, in most cases, you're also working in the time domain with transient wave fronts. So it makes sense to compare this experiment with the simulation in the time domain. But you are right, in principle, you have the same physics in the frequency domain. You can also do it in the frequency domain, if you like. So my second question is, uh, the geometry of the, the grains is quite uh, uh, rough or random or whatever. Um, how do you match that with the um, grid that you take, the discretization grid that you take, yeah, which is well, only uh, just rectangular? Uh, well, um, this kind of uh, numerical technique in contrast to final element techniques is using um, uh, a Cartesian grid. But the philosophy here is that you have um, a Cartesian grid for the uh, field components, but uh, concerning the material distributions, you are able to deal also with, with curved boundaries, for example, or with uh, partly filled material cells. And this is included in the technique, <coughs> so it um, is able to um, to precisely model um, the real grain, even if it's uh, it's not uh, perfectly uh, possible in a, in a rectangular grid. Uh, so this is a different philosophy compared to final elements, for example, where you try to use um, uh, tetrahedral uh, elements in order to better uh, discretize curved surfaces. Here it's done in another way. Um, so you keep the rectangular grid of the field components but try to, um, to take uh, curved interfaces inside this Cartesian grid into account. Okay, thank you. There, there is another, by the way, there is another possibility maybe to use so-called adaptive grid refinements for specific reasons, but this is not done here, but you could do it also in principle. Uh, just, uh, I have a question also. You have no viscous damping in. You're talking about attenuation, but you have no viscous damping in. Um, I, ha I didn't show it here, but it's uh, already included in the code. It's so you can also, for example, define viscoelasticity for each of the phases if you have the available data. to your data. opinion, is, is the backscattered energy more related to the size of the grains than, for instance, for residual stresses or dislocations and so on? Um, well, in, in the, my models in this case have no residual stresses. Of okay. course, if you have a, a, an, an application where residual stresses, for example, as the surface come into play, then maybe we have to, <coughs> to discuss this further. But in this case, in the models I showed, uh, it's clearly the, um, the number of interfaces and the impedance mismatch between the grains that is producing uh, the scattering. Yeah. We have time for last question. Uh, yeah, one short one. Yeah, well, I have a command and a question. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, yeah, you try to, to change the, uh, the tilt angle of the transducer in order to reduce the scattering. 
and you notice that it didn't work uh, because you used the specular act. I think in a more realistic configuration, you would try to to, to fortify the degrees and catch the defect using the, the backboard act. How many degrees? 45, say. 45? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because we are, we are still looking for a solution. So um, uh, if you have some ex experience in this field, I would be happy to discuss it uh, afterwards. Do that. Any questions? <laughs> no, uh, we'll just have to take a later. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.